Well, as I mentioned this morning in Bible study, this wasn't my uh, intended sermon. I started on it late yesterday and finished very late in the evening. And you may wonder why I actually changed my sermon topic. And it's, it's somewhat answered in the uh, actual title here, Because Error Exists. As I was looking through social media yesterday, I, I had just finished all of my work. Uh, the sermon was done, bulletin article was done, outlines were done, Bible study was done. And I sat back and I began to just relax for the evening. And I was r really saddened, I guess would be probably the best way to put it. As I began to look and there was uh, a, some Christians who were really in essence uh, addressing some other Christians who had just been involved in some things they ought not to be. And it was posted really uh, pretty straightforward with some Bible verses. And a gentleman, actually a minister in the church, had responded publicly on Facebook that um, posting those types of things was really hurtful to the in individuals and also very hurtful to the church. And that really they ought to quit doing that. I'll be honest, my first thought was, I wonder if that's what he teaches at the congregation where he's at, where you should never really tell anybody that what they're saying is, is wrong or anything that would make somebody think about what it is they're involved in religiously uh, is hurtful. But with that being said, I began to think about it. Why would a topic like this need to be addressed? And the answer very simply was this, well, because error exists. Uh, we know for a fact there are far too many religious groups out there today that need to be corrected. There are far, more, far too many congregations out there uh, in our religious world that need to be corrected. There are thousands of different groups, thousands of different teachings, and wonder, one often wonders why there are so many teachings and so many differences amongst the religious groups out there. And again, it's simply because error exists. I began to think a little bit about that. Now certainly with all of that taking place, and we've talked about this a few times, and this isn't intended to be one of those sermons where I try to really stick it to somebody. That's not the goal behind this. It really concerns me as I begin to look out amongst those who claim to be Christians, and yet, and you guys know it's true, you see people pointing fingers at each other saying, that's not okay, this is not okay, shame on you for even saying that, uh, especially when you see the Bible verses being given. And again, we know not only is this not logical, we know that it's not biblical because God's not the author of confusion. Listen to 1 Corinthians 14, 33. For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all churches of the saints. When all churches of the saints are abiding by just the New Testament, that is a faith of peace. We're at peace one with each other, and we're at peace with God. And again, we get that, we get that logically. But as much as public correction or even public discussions about religious things in which people disagree, as controversial as that appears to be and as divisive as that needs or seems to be, again, we understand this, actual division amongst those who claim to be followers of God, that's just not pleasing to God. And I know that. I'm going to go over to 1 Corinthians 1.10. If you have an outline, follow along with me on there. I'll pretty much hit these verses in order. I will add a few on the fly. But if you're wondering where I'm traveling through this sermon, the outline will take you right there. Notice 1 Corinthians 1.10. Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. And so yesterday, as I was looking through social media, what we actually had was two Christians, one actually, actually more than two, but one actually being a minister in the church, and he was saying, how dare you call these people out for what they're doing? The other guy said, I can't believe you're suggesting that I'm being unloving when you're calling me out for calling them out. Do you guys see the humor in that? And they're both pointing fingers, and here's the issue. They're, they're not speaking the same thing. And so in view of the constant opposition to publicly correcting brethren or non-Christians, or even having these types of discussions where, let's just face it, guys, and you've seen it, people seem to get so angry so fast. It really ought to cause each of us to go back and to look at the Scriptures to make sure that we are right. And so today, that's really what I'd like to spend a little bit of time on, really considering the proper attitude towards error. In other words, asking ourselves, what does God's Word actually teach us? teach on religious error. And again, why is this needed? Well, look at the title. Because error exists. 
So let that be our first point as we begin to break this down. And again, this isn't intended to be a, a stick it to them type of sermon. What this is intended to do is not only for me, and it did make me sit back and reflect, it ought to do the same for you. Each of us needs to ask ourselves, what am I doing because of the fact that error exists? So let's start off with that and make just this proclamation, guys, that error does exist. You've got people today who act like there is no such thing as religious error. You've even got brethren who act like there's no such thing as religious error. But there is such thing as false doctrine. It leads to false behaviors because of their beliefs and false actions. I want you to listen to what Jesus says over in Matthew 15, verse 8. We'll read down to verse 9. And we have a very good example of this. This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth, and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. It's vain because it's man's will, not God's will. And again, we've all seen something like this take place, where you've got someone saying, well, you know, I have read what the Scriptures teach there, but I think it should be done this way, or I'm not opposed to it being done in that way. Uh, I would prefer to do it this way. We've all seen that take place. Jesus makes it very clear when we start to uh, surpass God's Word to come up with the way we want to do things on our own, by our own desires. It's simply vain worship. Paul, over in 2 Timothy 4, verses 3 through 4, really gives us a warning. He says, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. You know, I began to think a little bit about that yesterday as I sat and I contemplated. I'll have you know, I, I didn't get involved. Oftentimes, I will read people having disagreements, some supporting with Scripture and so forth. I didn't get involved yesterday, and I oftentimes do not if there is sound brethren addressing the situation. Um, if I do see someone posting air and nobody's addressing it at that point, I oftentimes will. I didn't get involved in the conversation yesterday. But it did make me think about this passage as I thought about those who would not endure sound doctrine. Because the verses had been posted regarding the issue that was being discussed, of which then this minister came back and said, you know, this isn't beneficial to anybody. This isn't helpful to anybody. And I began to think, does he really want to endure in sound doctrine? And again, I, I told you, this really is a topic I addressed and, and did the extra work last night because of the concern and guys because of the love that we should all have for the Church of Christ. How many of you want your children to grow up in a congregation that is no longer enduring sound doctrine? Can you even contemplate the idea? How many people currently are in a, a congregation that no longer endures sound doctrine? Many of them not even knowing it anymore. There are people today that believe we shouldn't even make issues over doctrine. You have some, as a matter of fact, who don't even think we should use the word doctrine at all. You go back and you'll look in your Bible, you'll find that the word doctrine is used over 49 times. And so if the Bible has an emphasis on what it calls doctrine, certainly we as Christians ought to also. You've got many today, and, and we know it's true, some not Christians, some who are Christians, who would want you to believe that all different types of beliefs are okay. But here's what I want you to understand, and I think you guys get it all too well. Many of the people watching this on YouTube maybe do not. There is such thing as false ways. There is. I know the world we live in believes that there's no absolute morality, but that's not what the Bible teaches, and it's not even what people used to think many years ago. Listen to Proverbs 16.25. There is a way that seemeth right unto a man, notice this, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Now, here's what's really interesting. If you know your other passages, based off Romans 3.23 and 6.23, I know that what leads to death is sinful. And so based on this passage, when he talks about a way seeming right unto man that results in death, what I know he's talking about is sin. And therefore, logically, there has to be a way that is false. We get that. Go over to Psalms 119, 104. Again, this is a passage I would say most all of you are very familiar with. We use a lot of scripture here, so you've probably heard this passage a number of times. But in Psalms 119, 104, it says, Through thy precepts I get understanding. 
and therefore I hate every false way. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Why did the psalmist have to write this? Because error exists. Because error existed in the Old Testament and because error exists today. We get that there's only one way that leads to life. And the Bible goes on and says that everything else is false ways. It's ways contrived by man. And so since we've simply shown very clearly that there is such thing as false ways and there is such thing as false doctrines, even though we could use a lot more verses, this leads me to the logical then next step, which is if there is false ways and there is false doctrines, then there must be false teachers. That has to be the logical next step. Go on over to 2 Peter 2, 1 through 3. And I thought about this so much because as I, I sat and I really contemplated about what was being said and that you had men providing verses as to why they thought something was wrong. And it could have been a very cordial conversation. You then had someone who basically said, you know, this is just not beneficial. This doesn't help anybody. And I began to think, well, who exactly does it help? It helps anybody who's reading this, or maybe people who are seeking after the answer to this. It's, it should cause anyone to ask, is what I'm reading actually accurate or not? And is this person uh, a faithful preacher or one who is teaching something contrary to the Scriptures? Second Peter 2, 1 through 3 says this, But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them and bring upon themselves swift destruction. And many, notice this, and many shall follow their pernicious ways by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. And through covetousness shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you, whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. You know, it's funny, as I thought about this passage, it says, and many shall follow their pernicious ways by reasons of whom the way of truth, Christians, shall be evil spoken of. Or these here who are teaching this false doctrine. I began to think about, how many of you guys have read the articles where those who were promoting the truth were spoken evil of? You ever seen where people claim that the Church of Christ is a cult? You ever seen where somebody actually was a faithful Christian and wouldn't allow themselves to partake in sin and they were evil spoken of? I think many of us have seen this. There are those who are false teachers who are causing Christians to be evil spoken of, and then there are actually some Christians uh, who are living faithful and will be spoken of evilly because of their behavior. Go over to 2 Corinthians 11, verse 13. Paul can, continues on the thought that we saw from Peter. He says, For such are false apostles... Deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. And therefore it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. You have people who are literally ministering on behalf of Satan or the doctrines of Satan, and yet they're promoting themselves as ministers of righteousness. How many of you guys have ever listened to a minister who you knew was teaching false doctrine, and yet if you were to ask a number of people about what they thought about him, they would say, oh, he's a very good person, he's, very, he's a righteous man. There are those who are appearing to be righteous, but in reality they're teaching things that the Bible doesn't. Do we have that today? Sadly, we do. 2 Timothy 3.13 it says, but evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. And so, because we know there is false doctrine, and because we see that there will always be those false teachers teaching that, we are repeatedly warned against those who would try to deceive us. I'm going to go over to Ephesians 4.14. That we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro, and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they, lay, they lie in wait to deceive us. There are a number of people who are really being led to their destruction due to people out teaching error. And what you really oftentimes have is, is you have blind guides leading the blind. You, I mean, in your mind, have you guys ever seen back where they used to have a rope where blind people would actually hold on to the rope and travel in a group? 
Now imagine the guy who's leading the group also is blind. That's really what you have oftentimes. I want you to listen to what Jesus says over in Matthew 15, 14. We oftentimes act surprised that this is occurring. He says, let them alone. They be blind teachers of the blind, and if the blind lead the blind, both shall fall into the ditch. Let me say this real, really carefully before I move on, because there are a number of people we will come in contact with, even our own brethren, who oftentimes are following some blind leader because they themselves have been blinded. And this has nothing, guys, to do with sincerity. People can be very, very sincere. And we've all dealt with them on a regular basis, and we should lovingly try to, try to help them. But being, being uh, a believer of error or one who teaches or promotes error, it has nothing usually to do with sincerity. Sometimes it can, but for the most part it does not. Paul had an understanding that there were those going to come in who would, who would pervert the truth. And over in Acts 20, 29, as recorded by Luke, it says, For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. And also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away disciples after them. That minister who posted publicly on Facebook that we ought not to discuss these things or that it looked really bad, really, at least for me, he gave the impression to all, I think, that would read what he said, that there's more than one way to believe regarding what is considered truth or not truth, and there's also more than one way to deal with those that would teach things that maybe are not truthful. Again, it seems very confusing, so much so that I began to really be concerned that we, we here in this congregation may actually see this and start to believe some of these things. And so it's important for us to look at these, even though some people don't like these types of sermons, we have to ask the hard questions if we want to protect ourselves, protect our loved ones, and also protect the congregations that we worship with. We know that the Scriptures teach there is a very narrow way that leads to life. Go on over to Matthew 7, 13 and 14. That minister that I was reading his comments on gave the impression there might be more than one way to eternal life. And really, who are you to, to even question somebody else or to even point out if they are making a mistake? Who are you to do that? Jesus in Matthew 7, 13 says, Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And many there be which go in thereat, because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Most people today think there's number, a number of ways to heaven. I think a lot of us deal with it on a daily basis as we have conversations with those around us. The Bible plainly teaches otherwise. And you know why it does that? Look back at the title of the sermon. Because error exists. Now let's go down to the second point. Because we do know that error exists, because the Bible deals with it so plainly and unfortunately so often uh, feels the need to address that, we have responsibility towards error. Let's consider a few of these. One, and this wasn't occurring yesterday, we're to, we're to go out and to test every teacher. Do you guys think I, I just enjoy putting all my sermons on an outline form? Not that I don't make typos and make mistakes. That's not, that's not just for me, and that's not just for you. That's for both of us. That is for you to go back and test everything I say. Not only that, it's for me because I know I'm accountable for everything that I say. And so, knowing that you need to test what I say, and knowing that I need to be accountable for what I say, this is one of the best ways that we can always assure that what's being said or taught is in alignment with the Scriptures. We don't find that oftentimes being done today. I've actually talked with people who said, yeah, I don't like to put my sermons online because I don't want people to go back and actually dig through them and you know, call me up or question me on them. Or I don't like to write Bible articles or post them because I'm afraid that you know, I'm going to have to deal with that. That's what we're to do as Christians. Test every single thing. John uh, wrote in 1 John 4, 1, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. In essence, what he's saying is you need to do this because error exists. Again, the topic that we're looking at. 
I want you to notice what Luke has recorded for us over in Acts 17, 11. He describes those who knew this. They understood this. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica and that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures. That's the Old Testament scriptures. They searched the scriptures daily whether those things be so. How many people do you know who will listen to a sermon but not go back and search whether those things be so? Guys, it breaks my heart when I talk to people and they say, I believe this or I believe that, and you begin to talk to them and they have no idea what it is they really believe. They just repeat what they've heard somebody say. As Christians, we have to do this, and there's a number of reasons why, but we, have, we can't give encouragement and or the understanding or impression to other people that we might be okay with or that we might be in alignment with those that would teach things that are contrary to the Scriptures. That's why they had to uh, make this public proclamation about uh, this group. And some would say, well, why, do, why does it even need to be done publicly? Well, if people are practicing it publicly, shouldn't it be addressed publicly? I was always told by Brother Elkins, I wish he was still around, he would always say when people would ask about sin, he'd say, you need to repent of sin as publicly as sin is known. That's accurate. It's accurate. You also need to address things as publicly as they are publicly known. I'm going to go over to 2 John 1, verse 9, as we talk about not giving the impression that we're okay with certain things. You know, a lot of people just want to be hush-hush today. Don't cause a ruffle at the congregation. I mean, come on, is it really that important? Well, in 2 John 1, 9, it says, Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ. There's that word doctrine I told you you'd find in the Bible 49 times. Abideth not in the doctrine of Christ, hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. And if there come any unto you and bringeth not this doctrine, receive him not into your house, neither bid him God's speed. For he that biddeth him God's speed is partaker of his evil deeds. You can't give the impression to other people that you would be okay with such things. I'm not saying you need to go out and cut their tires and do bad things to them to show them you disagree with them, but you need to take a stance, and, and that stance oftentimes is simply just letting them know that's just not acceptable or that's not okay. And as a matter of fact, we're actually told that we're not to have fellowship with error, but rather to make it known and then to correct it. I'm going to go over to Ephesians 5.11. I think it really defines how this ought to be carried out, although there's a bunch more to this understanding. But in Ephesians 5.11 it says, "...and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness." but rather reprove them. You go back and you begin to talk about the words light, and you begin to talk about the words dark. And I don't think I put this in your notes, but if you look at John 3, 21, it shows us that truth is compared to light. And then if you go over to John 1, 5, it shows us that darkness is equated to sin. And guys, here's what's sad. Those that are in the darkness when the judgment comes or when they die, they're going to be lost eternally. We learn from Paul that at the time he wrote to the church there in Thessalonica that the Thessalonians were not in darkness. They actually had the light of truth. Listen to 1 Thessalonians 5.4. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, notice this, that the day should overtake you as a thief. Why is it necessary for us to let our brethren, or even those who are not yet Christians, know that maybe what they believe or what they teach is not in alignment with the Scriptures. The problem is, is if they don't know better, they're in the darkness. And for those of us who have loved ones like that, we don't want the day to overtake them as a thief. We want them to be prepared. Guys, that's not, that's not meant to be hateful. It's not, meant to, it's not meant to just say that I'm better than you and I know better than you. I think we get as Christians, we're not better than anybody, but we are, we are better informed and we are in a better standing with God as far as righteousness goes because of that understanding. Again, the minister that, that I read his remarks from, he, he was opposed to publicly pointing out error uh, or erroneous fellowship with those who are in sin. And then he said, basically, you really don't have any basis to go out and to do this. And I don't even know if they posted the passages. I didn't read anymore because I was working on my next sermon. But I began to think of Romans 16, 17. Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses. Con Notice this. This isn't like talking about carpet color. Contrary to the doctrine. There's that word doctrine again, guys. 
which ye have learned, and avoid them. For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. He's talking about avoiding and marking these or making known these people who are, who are teaching this. If and when this doesn't happen, division occurs. One, because we're no longer in fellowship with those who now hold to a doctrine that's not found in the Bible. And two, because they're no longer in fellowship with God. That's where the problem arises. Now, the other day I was actually reading through Facebook. I can't even tell you what was being discussed. But I, I remember as I read through it, there was a Christian, and I don't remember the passage, but the guy quoted the passage and said, you're wrong. Here is the passage. He explained it very lengthy. I read through it all. And the gentleman came back and said, I still don't believe that. And so he recovered the entire thing again, very lengthy. And the fellow Christian said, I still don't believe that. And so he then addressed it a third time. And then when he did that, he said, now that I've addressed this the third time with you and you have continued to reject it, I am marking you publicly as a heretic and I'm going to let everybody know that what you teach is false doctrine. And what's funny was I saw people come back and they said, that is the most unloving. That is the most judgmental. That is the most damaging and divisive thing I have ever seen take place between two Christians. That's what somebody had posted. Listen to Titus 3, 10, and 11. A man that is an heretic after the first and second admonition reject. This guy actually went above and beyond and taught him a third time before he did this and said, but this is what's going to take place. Why? It says, knowing that he is, that is such is subverted and sinneth, being condemned of, his, of himself. The man in sin who refuses con correction continuously, he's the one who's unloving. He's the one who's damaging the cause of Christ by going out and not only rejecting the, the plain, simple faith, but then teaching something else to other people. And again, as we mentioned earlier, as Christians, we are to hate every evil way. Not that one's any worse than another. I've had people ask, oh, I can't believe that guy's involved in that sin. And yet they may be involved in something else. And in their mind, it doesn't seem that bad. But we're to hate every false way. Again, Psalms 119, 104, through thy precepts, I get understanding. And therefore, I hate every false way. We learn what to love and what to promote. And we learn what to hate as we begin to look through the scriptures. We get a clear understanding that the Bible tells us as followers of God what it is that we are to love. Listen to Romans 12, 9. Let love be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil. Cleave to that which is good. Again, so simple. So simple. When you begin to look at the Bible, when you begin to look at the New Testament faith, guys, it is so simple. It's interesting. I started to think a little bit about this as I thought about where it is that I work. Uh, and so I deal with product being produced off of a machine. And you guys know how I know what is good or bad? Everything regarding the product being made is recorded on a piece of paper. I literally can walk over, I can pick the part up off the machine, I can walk over, I can hold it up to the paper, and I can look down and I can see whether it meets or it does not meet. People think the Christian faith is so hard, guys, but it's not. It's all recorded right here. It's just a simple work instruction and it shows us what meets and what does not meet. And I, I go back and today I was... I always listen to a sermon as I'm preparing for my sermon in the morning. This morning I, I listened to Brother Guy in Woods, and I began to think about those men in the past who used to just preach the pure gospel. Guys like Brother Garland Elkins, guys like Brother Curtis Cates, guys like Brother Franklin Camp, guys like Brother Foy E. Wallace Jr., guys like Brother Guy in Woods, people today like Brother John Shannon, people, to, people like Marshall Keeble. Brother Marshall Keeble, if you guys have never listened to Brother Marshall Keeble, he preached just the most simple, straightforward gospel. And guys, they may not have all been eloquent, but I will tell you, those men who preach that just basic, fundamental gospel, they have done more for the cause of Christ than all of the compromising Christians or so-called Christians in denominational groups or community churches put together. Those men just cause divisions. They just cause confusion. We need to understand this as we talk about the fact that error exists. And because error exists, we are to war against error. 
It's funny, the Christian is one really who, I guess in times past, if you would ask what they thought about war, for the most part, if you didn't give any more information, they would say they are opposed to war. But when you begin to talk about things relating to religion, we understand as Christians we are to wage war. We are to war against everything that is considered error. Listen to Jude 1, three. When I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. Now go over to 1 Timothy 1.18. That's going to be hard. That's going to be a lot of work. And when you've got two men who disagree on something and both of them have got their feet dug into the, stand, into the sand, that's oftentimes what it's going to seem like. It's going to be like a war. 1 Timothy 1.18, This charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before on thee, that thou, mightest, that thou by them mightest war a good warfare, holding faith and a good conscience, which some, have, having put away concerning the faith, have made shipwreck, of whom is Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have delivered unto Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. And you go back, and we actually had Brother Joe read it today before we had our sermon. We actually read from Ephesians 6, uh, 10 through 17. But you actually learn there really from 13 through 17 uh, relating to the, to the armor of God for the Christian. And I'm going to just go down to Ephesians 6, 17 if you don't remember the last verse Joe read. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. You begin to talk about the offensive weapon for the Christian it is the Word of God. That's why Christians rely so heavily on the Word. It's why we're quoting book, chapter, and verse when we see somebody teaching something and we know that it's not true, or when we are teaching something which is true and we need to reinforce it. Book, chapter, and verse, right? It's like those guys in the, in the old time preaching that you just don't hear so much. Just book, chapter, and verse. Why? Because it's the sword. And why is it needed? Because error exists. Let's go down and cover another point here. Certainly then we can understand that withstanding error is absolutely necessary. You guys will get this, but let me say it for those who are watching this on YouTube or maybe on our live stream. Nobody can be saved by error. Let me say it again. Nobody can be saved by error. We know that logically. We can only be saved by truth. Go over to 2 Thessalonians 2.13. It says, But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you. Brethren beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation. A lot of people think God just chooses certain people, and certainly you find that as one of the Calvinistic tenets. But let's see how they're chosen as we continue reading. Chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit. How did that sanctification of the Spirit happen? Notice, in belief of the truth. It's only the truth that can sanctify anybody. Thus, it's only the truth that can allow anybody to be saved. We get that again. You know, people, they get so angry when we talk and we have disagreements on teaching or disagreements on religious groups or disagreements where one can bind or where one can loose. But again, guys, you can't be saved in any group which does not teach or does not believe or does not practice the faith. Again, Jesus made it very clear that there is a narrow way. The narrow way simply is the New Testament. Go over to 1 Peter 1.22. We understand, or at least we ought to, the only way you're going to purify your soul is by knowing and adhering to the Word of God. 1 Peter 1.22 says, Seeing ye have purified your souls. <laughs> I love how the Bible just explains itself so you can't mess it up. How do I purify my soul? He goes on, In obeying the truth. How did that truth come? Through the Spirit. Oh, miraculous revelation through the Holy Spirit. Unto unfeigned love of the brethren, and see that you love one another with a pure heart fervently. That verse is important because Peter makes a connection between the purification of our souls and the truth. Again, the Word of God. And thus, any error that somebody would believe or any error that would cause somebody to be lost, that really should cause me as a Christian who loves them, who loves their soul, and wants them to be purified, to go back and correct anything that would endanger their soul. Not only that, it would want us to stop at the front door anything that would come in here which would endanger the congregation. Guys, it hurts me that we even have to talk about things like this. 
we don't talk about these things again because we, we have this I'm greater than you or, 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 you know, I just want to rub your nose in it. That's not what this is. How many of you guys are really worried about the church? How many of you have seen a degradation in what we call the church? It's getting worse and it's getting worse. And the sad part is, guys, is the majority of people don't see it and they don't know it. And then when you try to point it out, they begin to get upset. Error denies the necessity of obedience. Go over to Matthew 7, 21. We already covered 13 and 14, but I never read those passages without going down to Matthew 7, 21. And I think about this really all throughout the week as I deal with people on a regular basis. It says, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father. Let me, let me read that part one more time. Who's going to enter into the kingdom of heaven? But he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Is he talking about the, the Baptist groups doing the will? Is he talking about the Methodist groups doing the will, Pentecostal? There's none of that in there. It's just my will, the new will and testament that we live by, right? Which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? Do you have people doing that today? Right down the road we have it going on. And in thy name have cast out demons, and in thy name done many wonderful works. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. You've got people who are going to hear that that are not Christians. And you've got people who are Christians who are going to hear that. I've talked to a lot of people who think they're going to heaven just because they're a member of the Church of Christ. That's the same mindset I had as a Catholic. And I didn't place any value on the Word or even ask myself whether I was in alignment with it. My simple viewpoint was I'm a member of this religious group, and thus that will get me into heaven. But it's so much more than that. If one church is as good as another or if doctrine uh, doesn't matter, why can't somebody just start their own church and come up with their own rules, even denying the blood of Christ is necessary? Let me say this real quick before I move on. Ephesians 1, 7, I didn't write these down, I don't think. Ephesians 1, 7 and John, 1 John 1, 7 show us the blood is necessary. Acts 20, 28 shows us that Jesus purchased the church with that blood. Matthew 26, 28 shows us that Jesus' blood givers, gives the remission of sins. And then we learn in Romans 6, 3, and 4 that we're baptized into his death, which is where we actually come into contact with the blood. I said all of that to say this. You've got people out there who teach that Jesus' blood has, has nothing to do with one's salvation. People can go out and teach whatever they want, and some modern religious groups are doing this. You even have congregations, which I guess used to be faithful at one point, teaching different things on a number of different topics. Why? Well, they've been deceived, and so we get the idea that error deceives people. Listen to 1 John 1, 6. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. You ever known somebody who claimed fellowship with the Father and with the Son, but... They didn't do the truth. They walked in darkness. I, I'll be careful who I say this in case he's watching. So I work with a gentleman. I won't tell you where, he, where I work with him at so they can't tell who, who I'm talking about, but he, he portrays himself as a Christian, and I wish you could hear the words come out of his mouth or hear when he talks about drinking alcohol or hear about any of the other number of things that I hear him say even though he wears jewelry, I'll be very careful even not mentioning which type of jewelry he wears, that is all Christian related. He gives this impression that he's a faithful follower of God, but the problem is as many of the things he, do, he does are not considered truth. We've been warned, Colossians 2.8, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. Even those who at one time were faithful, even those congregations who at one time were faithful could be deceived or even susceptible at some point to falling. I think that's why we try so hard in, in teaching our youth, not only through the ways that we teach them, and thank, thank you teachers who teach our youth on Wednesday nights, because when they're brought up being taught the word, it's very hard to deceive somebody who has been taught the truth and really had it ingrained into them. But I want you to understand that there are those who at one time were faithful who've been deceived. Listen to Matthew 24, 24. Jesus says, For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, 
and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. And again, let's not take that into the Calvinistic tenet of unconditional election. We understand that the elect are those who have obeyed the gospel. They are the ones who are chosen through the gospel and their faithfulness according to it. Error simply condemns the soul. Go on over to Titus 1, 13 and 14. Paul writes to Titus, This witness is true, and wherefore rebuke them sharply, that they may be sound in the faith, not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men that turn from the truth. Why don't you go on over to Galatians 1, 6 through 9, and then we'll cover our last point. I try not to go too long. I actually could have added, I had three more points I wanted to add on here, but I could have, I would have preached until 6 o'clock tonight. Listen to Galatians 1, 6 through 9. It says, I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel uh, unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. Have you guys ever asked yourself why somebody would be obeying another gospel? Go back up and look at the title of the sermon again. Because error exists. That's why they're doing it. Because error exists. Let's cover our last point. I want you to consider the advantages of knowing and teaching the truth. And as I do this, again, I'm not doing this to say that we are better than those, but I do want you to place yourself in your position of righteousness in God's sight, knowing with what you know. For those of us who are Christians who do know and understand the Bible and also then follow it, we understand that the truth makes us free and sanctifies us. I oftentimes will use these two passages together. You're very familiar with them. John 8, 31 and 32. Then Jesus said to those Jews which believed on him, If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. How often have we heard somebody say, but what really is truth? Isn't that what Pilate asked him? What is, what is truth? Well, go on over to John 17, 17. Because we need to ask ourselves, is it important for us to understand this? Well, it is because obedience to the truth sanctifies. And John 17, 17 says, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. That's why we use book, chapter, and verse. I heard a preacher say this. I think I mentioned it some time ago. And as I thought about it, it was pretty funny. Somebody asked, and I agree with him, someone asked why he used so much scripture. And he said, With so much self-doubt I have regarding myself, the more scripture I use, the more accurate I know my sermon will be. Because if I make a mistake, at least that's right. You guys ever thought about that? It's hard to make a mistake when you quote scripture. So I began to think a little bit about that. Truth contains all the good works and everything that would be pleasing to God. Going over to 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. Again, it's a passage you're all familiar with. These are the ones that just kind of pop through the head as you're working through here. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine. There's that word again. Gee, guys, I laugh every time I see that word because it just really emphasizes to me that the church that our Lord and Savior said He was going to build, it is, build, it is built on a set, uh, understandable uh, group of requirements, very clearly laid out for us in the New Testament. It's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, that word complete, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And so knowing that, we study the Word so that we'll be prepared to correctly handle the Word of Truth. I'm going to go down to 2 Timothy 2.15, which says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the Word of Truth. Peter says it this way, but he gives the very same idea, and I actually used this the other day. 1 Peter 3.15, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. Hopefully you guys are... Uh, ready for what he says here. And be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. I had a discussion with my boss this, this last week, and we were talking about if people ask us things on the floor that are religious. And I said, if somebody asks me a religious question, I, I don't really care what the workplace's rule is on whether I can answer it or not. I will answer it. And I cited that verse and said, I'm required to do such. And if they, have, if they ask me that question, I have the right to answer it. 
I'm glad he didn't have a problem with that. We need to be, we need to be ready. We do, guys. We need to be ready. There are sincere people that are looking for this. The truth is able to provide us with our inheritance. I'm not talking about an earthly inheritance. Many of us, I would say, when we die, probably won't leave a whole lot of stuff behind. Maybe a few possessions that we do somewhat cherish. For the most part, we understand that we'll leave no real earthly inheritance behind, but we do have a spiritual inheritance. Go over to Acts 20, 32. And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. Why are we out teaching people the truth? Why are we correcting when people teach mistruth? Why are we worried about this inheritance? Because error exists. Because it's affecting those who are not yet Christians and it's affecting many who are Christians. And so with that being said, let me summarize with this. Let's have a strong desire for the truth. Let's have a strong love for the word so that we can be saved. Let us strive to have a good understanding of the truth and strive to teach those around us lovingly the truth. And with all of that being said, let us in all things, in faith, in practice, in worship, do exactly as the truth directs. Now with that being said, if you're here, I want you to follow the truth if you're wanting to become a Christian. How do you do that? It's not complicated. The truth, according to our scriptures, for all those who became Christians was so simple. Somebody taught them the gospel. Faith comes by hearing, Romans 10, 17. And so they were, taught, they were taught about Jesus. They were taught why He came. They were taught about what His blood could do, the church He established, and the consequence of sin in their life, and that everybody has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, Romans 3, 23. Because of that, there will be punishment, Romans 6, 23. And all men need to repent, Acts 17, 30. And everybody needs to confess the name of Christ, Romans 10, 9, and 10. And all men everywhere, regardless of what anybody else says to you, needs to be baptized in water for the remission of sins, Acts 2.38. If you're here and you haven't done that yet, or if you're watching this online and you've not done that yet, you've not been added to the church, Acts 2.47. You've apparently been mistaught or you've been deceived if you've been taught anything else, and that's because error does exist. If you're here and you've not obeyed the gospel, you can still do it this very hour. If you're here and you're a Christian, if there's an area you've fallen short, if there's something you need to repent of, please go back and do it. Rectify that situation so you can again be righteous. First John 1, 7 through 9. But if there's a way we can help you in any way, you can come forward as Brother John leads us in a song of invitation.